everyone, let's go back in time together and learn something new. Chapter 1, The Man Behind the Discovery Christopher Columbus, the man who would irrevocably shape the course of world history, had humble beginnings. Born in 1451 in the bustling port city of Genoa, located in what is now modern-day Italy, Columbus was the son of a wool weaver, Domenico Colombo, and his wife, Susanna Fontanarossa. Growing up in a modest, hard-working family, young Christopher Columbus was surrounded by the maritime culture that permeated Genoa. From the bustling wharves and the endless comings and goings of ships to the tales of seafaring adventures brought back by the sailors, Columbus's childhood environment was one that fostered a deep fascination with the sea and exploration. Although there are few records of Columbus's formal education, his writings indicate that he was largely self-taught, with a keen interest in geography, astronomy, and navigation. Moreover, he was multilingual, fluent in Latin, Spanish, and Portuguese, which would prove instrumental in his future endeavors. Columbus began his sailing career in the Mediterranean, working on merchant ships that traded along the coastlines of the Mediterranean Sea. These voyages, often to places like Greece, Cyprus, and even as far as North Africa, laid the groundwork for his navigational skills. Moreover, they exposed him to a variety of cultures, peoples, and, importantly, the tales of the East with its rich spices, silks, and untold wealth. In the mid-1470s, Columbus relocated to Portugal, a nation leading in maritime innovation and exploration. Portugal had become the epicenter of European exploration by the late 15th century, with notable figures like Prince Henry the Navigator fostering an environment conducive to maritime exploration. Columbus's decision to move was not incidental, it was here that he first conceived his idea of reaching Asia by sailing westward, contrary to the popular route around Africa being pursued by the Portuguese. In Lisbon, Columbus married Filipa Moniz Perestrello, a noblewoman who was the daughter of Bartolomeu Perestrello, a prominent sea captain. This union not only helped elevate Columbus's social standing but also provided him with access to important maritime documents and charts, including those about the winds and currents of the Atlantic, which her father had collected. These documents were pivotal in helping Columbus formulate his theories about sailing west to reach the east. However, life in Portugal was not devoid of challenges. Columbus became a widower, and later, the father to a young son, Diego. Seeking a stable future for his son and driven by an insatiable urge to realize his theory, Columbus began to seek support for his ambitious venture. Aided by his brother Bartolomeo, who was a mapmaker, Columbus began formulating plans to pitch to the monarchs of Europe, unknowingly setting the stage for a voyage that would forever alter the course of human history. Columbus's early years in Genoa, his extensive sailing experience in the Mediterranean, his move to Portugal, and his relentless pursuit of his theory were integral in shaping him into the man who would undertake the daunting voyage across the Atlantic. Though his journey was fraught with obstacles, his determination and resilience would eventually lead to the discovery of the new world, fundamentally transforming the geopolitical landscape of the time. Chapter 2, An Audacious Proposal Columbus's proposition to reach the East by voyaging westward was considered audacious, if not outrageous, during the late 15th century. The common belief was that the Earth's size would make such a journey impracticably long, and unknown perils lurked in the open ocean. However, Columbus was guided by a geographical misunderstanding that led him to significantly underestimate the Earth's circumference, believing Asia was much closer than it actually was. Columbus had drawn from a range of sources, including the works of Claudius Ptolemy, Pierre d'Ailly, and Marinus of Tyre, creating a synthesis that, while novel, significantly miscalculated the Earth's size and the breadth of the ocean sea. He estimated the journey westward from Canary Islands to Japan to be around 2,400 nautical miles, while in reality, it spans approximately 10,000 nautical miles. This critical misjudgment of scale, although inaccurate, played a vital role in spurring Columbus to undertake his risky transatlantic voyage. Driven by this flawed geographical understanding and an insatiable desire for exploration, Columbus sought patronage for his expedition. His initial efforts were directed towards King John II of Portugal, the leading maritime power of the time. However, the king's esteemed panel of geographers and navigators rejected Columbus's proposal, 
pointing out the errors in his calculations and the unrealistic nature of his enterprise. Undeterred, Columbus then turned to other monarchies. He sent his brother Bartolomeo to England to negotiate with King Henry VII, while he himself journeyed to Spain. Unfortunately, the proposal faced similar rejection in England. Meanwhile, in Spain, King Ferdinand, and Queen Isabella, preoccupied with the Reconquista, the war to expel the Moors from Granada, held off any immediate decision. The years from 1486 to 1492 were a test of Columbus's perseverance. He continued to plead his case to the Spanish monarchs, often residing in the monastery of La Rabida near the port of Palos. During this time, Columbus formed connections with individuals who would become pivotal in persuading the Spanish monarchs, such as Antonio de Marchena and Juan Pérez, both of whom had the monarch's ear. The capitulation of Granada in January 1492 marked a turning point. With the Reconquista completed, Ferdinand and Isabella could now turn their attention to Columbus's proposal. Furthermore, the success of the Reconquista instilled in the monarchs a zeal for expansion and propagation of Catholic Christianity. This coincided with Columbus's promise of new territories and potential converts in the East. Columbus's persistence finally bore fruit in April 1492 when the monarchs, likely swayed by the potential benefits of his proposal, agreed to sponsor his journey. The capitulations of Santa Fe, the agreement between Columbus and the Spanish crown, promised Columbus governorship over any new lands he discovered and a tenth of all riches obtained. It had been an uphill battle for Columbus, but his audacious proposal, fueled by his unyielding belief in his geographical theory and a desire to carve a quicker trade route to Asia, had finally received royal assent. The explorer could now prepare for the voyage that would not only prove transformative for him but would change the world in a way no one at the time could fully comprehend. Chapter 3, A Journey Begins with the sponsorship of the Spanish crown secured, Columbus embarked on the preparation for his transatlantic voyage. The town of Palos de la Frontera, where Columbus was currently residing, was chosen as the departure point. The location was no mere coincidence. As part of the settlement of a lawsuit, the town had been ordered to provide two ships for a year's service to the crown. These two ships, the Pinta and the Nina, would form two-thirds of Columbus's fleet. The Pinta and the Nina, both caravel-type ships, were light, nimble, and ideal for exploration. The Pinto was the fastest of the three, while the Nina, the smallest, was praised for its ability to sail into the wind. The final ship, the Santa Maria, was a larger, slower vessel known as a Nau or a Carrick, chosen for its ability to carry significant cargo. The Santa Maria, the flagship of this small fleet, was owned by Juan de la Cosa, a mariner and cartographer who would also serve as the ship's master. Assembling the crews for these ships was another challenge. Despite the potential for great rewards, the venture was deemed risky and even foolhardy by many. Columbus, however, was able to gather a crew of about 90 men, drawn by the promise of adventure, riches, and royal favor. Among them were experienced sailors, servants, a few gentlemen seeking glory, and convicts offered pardons for their crimes. The officers of the expedition included the Pinzon brothers, Martin Alonso, Francisco Martin, and Vicente Yanez, who were well-respected seamen from Palos and instrumental in recruiting the crew and securing the Pinta and the Nina. The voyage was given a spiritual blessing when Columbus and his crew, dressed in a religious brotherhood's white robes, participated in a mass at La Rabida Monastery. The mass, officiated by the monastery's friar Juan Pérez, an early supporter of Columbus, lent a religious solemnity to the enterprise. It underlined the dual objectives of the expedition, to open new trade routes and to spread Christianity. After months of intense preparation, on the morning of August 3, 1492, the three ships set sail, the Santa Maria leading the Pinta and the Nina. They first sailed to the Canary Islands for final provisioning and repairs, especially to the Pinta, which had an issue with its rudder. On September 6, the real journey into the unknown began as Columbus led his fleet into the open Atlantic, sailing westward into uncharted waters. Columbus's perseverance, strategic planning, and leadership were instrumental in turning his audacious plan into reality. 
The departure from Palos marked not only the beginning of a historic journey but also a crucial step in a larger process that would eventually connect the world in a global network of exchange, forever transforming the known world. Chapter 4, A Trying Voyage The journey undertaken by Columbus and his crew across the Atlantic was fraught with challenges, unknown risks, and internal discord, making it one of the most trying voyages of the era. The three ships, carrying men who had primarily sailed known routes in the familiar Mediterranean or along the African coast, were now venturing into an immense and largely unknown ocean. Navigating across the open Atlantic was a formidable task. There were no landmarks, no known stars to guide them as they moved away from the coasts, only the wide, empty ocean. Yet Columbus and his crew, utilizing the cutting-edge navigational tools and knowledge of the time, managed this formidable task. They relied on dead reckoning, a technique that used previously known positions, the course the ship was steering, and the distance it had traveled over a known time to determine the current position. To measure speed, they used a simple but effective device called a logline, consisting of a wooden board attached to a knotted rope. The board was thrown overboard, and the knots on the rope were counted for a specific amount of time, giving an estimate of the ship's speed. Despite these tools, the journey was not smooth. The ships had to withstand stormy weather and calm periods with no winds, which severely delayed their progress. There was fear of sea monsters and of sailing off the edge of the world. Food supplies dwindled, and the hardtack, a type of dry biscuit that formed the primary diet on board, became worm-ridden over time. Fresh water turned foul, and the absence of fresh fruits and vegetables led to scurvy among the crew. These conditions fueled despair, and there were whispers of mutiny. Columbus, however, managed these trying conditions with leadership and cunning. Aware of the rising descent, he maintained two logbooks, one with the correct estimates of distances traveled and one with reduced estimates. The latter, shown to the crew, was an attempt to mitigate their fears of having ventured too far from home. Tensions reached a peak by the beginning of October, and some historians suggest that the crew gave Columbus a deadline, if land was not sighted in a certain number of days, they would turn back. The pressure on Columbus was immense. On October 12, 1492, after two months and nine days at sea, the long-awaited cry of Tierra, Tierra, echoed across the Pinta. Juan Rodriguez Bermejo, known as Rodrigo de Triana, a lookout on the Pinta, had sighted land. Although it was Columbus who was later officially credited with the sighting, it was undoubtedly a moment of collective relief and exhilaration for all on board. The sighting of land marked the end of their grueling journey across the Atlantic. Although they believed they had reached the Indies, they had, in fact, arrived at an entirely new continent, unknown to them, a land that would later come to be known as the Americas. Chapter 5, Landfall and Exploration On the dawn of October 12, 1492, after an arduous and tumultuous voyage across the Atlantic, the sight of a small island in the present-day Bahamas archipelago brought a collective sigh of relief from the crew of Columbus's expedition. Unbeknownst to them, they were not on the shores of the Indies as they had imagined, but rather, on the cusp of an entirely new world. As Columbus set his foot on this new land, he named it San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior, believing he was the first European to do so. One of our primary sources for understanding Columbus's exploration and interactions with the native population is his own diary, as well as the abstract of his log made by Bartolomé de las Casas. According to these accounts, Columbus was struck by the natural abundance of the land and its gentle inhabitants, whom he described as peaceful and generous, lacking in weapons, and carrying no knowledge of European customs. These people were the Tainos, a subgroup of the Arawak people, who were the primary inhabitants of the islands of the Greater Antilles. They greeted Columbus and his crew with curiosity and generosity. However, Columbus, driven by his quest for wealth and a path to the riches of the Indies, interpreted their generosity as a sign of potential subservience, and their lack of European-style weapons as an opportunity for easy conquest. As Columbus explored further, he discovered that these islands were part of a large archipelago, which he named the Indies continuing to labor under the illusion that he had reached the outskirts of Asia. He took possession of many of these islands on behalf of the Spanish crown, often performing a ceremonial act of cutting branches from trees or digging up small quantities of earth. 
Columbus and his crew sailed from island to island, including present-day Cuba and Hispaniola. Along this journey, he collected samples of spices and gold, convinced he had found the route to the fabled riches of the East. In his encounters with the Tainos, Columbus was struck by their gold ornaments, which sparked his interest. He pursued information about their source, receiving answers that spoke of a great cacique, or chief, who lived on an island rich in this precious metal. This led to the expedition's journey to Hispaniola, the island shared today by Haiti and the Dominican Republic. While the initial reception by the Tainos was welcoming, relations between the natives and the Europeans became strained as Columbus's expedition demanded more food, gold, and other resources. The Europeans' violence and disregard for the native cultures were becoming evident, setting a pattern that future explorers and colonizers would follow. An important event during their stay in Hispaniola was the wreck of the Santa Maria on Christmas Eve. With the ship irreparable, Columbus decided to establish a settlement, La Navidad, built from the ship's timbers, where he left 39 of his men with instructions to explore and amass gold. In January 1493, Columbus left Hispaniola to return to Spain. With the Niña and a makeshift vessel, as the Pinta had gone missing, only to rejoin them later, he carried with him Tainos, taken without their consent, tropical birds, gold ornaments, and various artifacts, to show King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Chapter 6, Return to Spain and Recognition Having left behind a small settlement and around 40 of his men in the hastily constructed fort of La Navidad in Hispaniola, Columbus commenced his return journey to Spain on January 16, 1493. The passage back across the Atlantic proved to be as challenging as the journey westward had been. The two remaining ships, the Niña and the Pinta, were separated during a violent storm, each making its way independently back to Spain. Despite these challenges, Columbus arrived triumphantly in the port of Lisbon on March 4, and subsequently in Palos de la Frontera on March 15, where they had set off more than seven months prior. With him, he brought gold, spices, and other exotic items from the lands he had explored. Most strikingly, he also brought several Tainos, taken from their homes and families to be paraded before the Spanish court as evidence of a newly discovered people. Columbus was received as a hero in Spain. He immediately wrote a letter to the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, detailing his discoveries, which was later widely published. His descriptions of gold and spices, as well as the prospects of converting the native inhabitants to Christianity, filled the court with a sense of excitement and anticipation. The triumphant explorer was invited to the court at Barcelona to give a personal account of his journey. Dressed in a fine robe and accompanied by the Taino captives and the exotic specimens he had brought back, Columbus presented a vivid account of his journey and the lands and peoples he had encountered. His accomplishments were rewarded handsomely. Ferdinand and Isabella granted him the title of Admiral of the Ocean Sea and Viceroy and Governor of the Indies. He was promised a significant share of any wealth that might flow from his discoveries. This recognition was not merely financial, it was a profound elevation in social status, transforming Columbus, the self-made Genoese mariner, into a nobleman in the Spanish court. Nevertheless, Columbus's narrative was met with skepticism by some at court. His insistence that he had reached Asia was questioned, and the lack of abundant riches he had promised led to some disappointment. However, the potential of this new route to the Indies and its implications for trade and Christianity spread were widely recognized. While Columbus basked in the glow of his successes, preparations were soon underway for a second, larger expedition. As the news of his discoveries spread, a wave of excitement swept across Europe, sparking a rush for exploration and colonization that would transform the world. Chapter 7, Later Voyages and Challenges Following the triumph of his first voyage, Christopher Columbus was no longer the obscure Genoese mariner who had once struggled to find patrons for his audacious plan. He was now the Admiral of the Ocean Sea, poised to lead a larger, more ambitious expedition to the lands he had discovered. However, as we will see, his subsequent voyages would be marked by various challenges and disappointments that would tarnish his reputation and complicate his relationship with the Spanish monarchy. Columbus embarked on his second voyage in September 1493, commanding a fleet of 17 ships, loaded with 1,200 men, 
including soldiers, farmers, and craftsmen, to establish a permanent colony in the Indies. When they arrived at Hispaniola, they found the fort of La Navidad destroyed and the men he had left behind killed, a dark omen of the increasingly fraught relations between the Europeans and the indigenous Tainos. Despite this setback, Columbus pressed on, founding a new settlement called La Isabella. However, the site proved unsuitable, with poor soil and a lack of fresh water. Illness struck the colony, and discontent among the settlers grew. Columbus's leadership was challenged, as he was often away exploring other parts of the Caribbean. His harsh rule, the harsh punishments he meted out, and his singular focus on finding gold further alienated his followers. As Columbus explored more islands in the Caribbean and parts of the Central American mainland, he encountered diverse indigenous cultures and landscapes. However, he consistently failed to find the rich civilizations and abundant gold sources he had promised to the Spanish monarchs. Instead, his letters back home began to emphasize the potential for converting the native peoples to Christianity, perhaps to deflect attention from the lack of material wealth. Columbus's third voyage, beginning in 1498, led to the discovery of the South American mainland. Yet this voyage was marked by further difficulties. Back in Hispaniola, rebellion had broken out against Columbus's rule. Stories of mismanagement, brutality, and the lack of promised riches reached the Spanish court. The Spanish monarchy, having lost faith in Columbus, sent Francisco de Bobadilla in 1500 to investigate. Arriving in Hispaniola, Bobadilla was horrified by the conditions and the reports of Columbus's rule. He arrested Columbus and his brothers, placing them in chains, and sent them back to Spain. Although Columbus was eventually released and forgiven by the monarchs, he was stripped of his governorship. This was a significant blow to Columbus, who had tied his identity and status to his role as Admiral and Viceroy of the Indies. Nevertheless, Columbus was given one more chance to redeem himself. His fourth and final voyage, from 1502 to 1504, was aimed at finding a strait through the islands to the Indian Ocean. This journey led him to explore parts of Central America, but the strait, of course, did not exist. This voyage, filled with shipwrecks, storms, and hostile encounters with indigenous people, was perhaps the most harrowing. Columbus returned to Spain in 1504, exhausted and in poor health. His dreams of establishing a prosperous colony and finding a direct route to Asia were never realized. He had sailed the Atlantic four times, explored extensive territories, and initiated the sustained encounter between Europe and the Americas. Yet, his final years were marked by disappointments and legal struggles to regain his lost titles and privileges. He died in 1506, wealthy but embittered, still insisting that he had reached the outskirts of Asia. Chapter 8, The Last Days of Columbus After a life of sea voyages and exploration, the last years of Christopher Columbus were spent on solid ground, embroiled in a bitter battle for recognition and legitimacy. The Genoese Mariner, who had once stood in the spotlight of the Spanish court as the man who had opened a new world to European powers, found himself in his final years a fallen hero, fighting to recover his lost titles and privileges. Stripped of his governorship after his third voyage and replaced by Francisco de Bobadilla, Columbus was not only materially but also psychologically affected. He felt betrayed by his patrons, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, to whom he had devoted his monumental discoveries. Nevertheless, he had a final opportunity with his fourth voyage, but even that did not lead to the redemption he so desired. Instead, it was a strenuous journey that further strained his already frail health. When Columbus returned to Spain after his final voyage in November 1504, he found a country in mourning. Queen Isabella, his primary advocate at court, had fallen ill and died. This was a severe blow to Columbus, who had hoped that the queen would restore him to his former status. The loss of his patroness marked the beginning of a period of hardship and obscurity. With the Spanish court largely unresponsive to his appeals, Columbus dedicated his final years to a rigorous campaign to restore his lost titles and wealth. He petitioned King Ferdinand, sent letters to the court, and lodged legal claims. These efforts, however, met with little success. Despite the wealth he had accumulated from his voyages, his final years were consumed by legal and financial difficulties. Physically, Columbus was also declining. His health, 
compromised by the hardships of sea life, deteriorated. He suffered from various ailments including what is suspected to be reactive arthritis, leading to severe joint pain, fever, and eye inflammation. Despite his afflictions, Columbus remained mentally vigorous, penning a book of prophecies where he asserted his role in the divine plan for the end of the world. In his will, Columbus attempted to secure the rights and titles granted to him and his descendants by the Spanish crown. He instructed his heirs to uphold the Admiral of the Ocean Seas title and ensure that it was passed down through subsequent generations. Despite the crown's reluctance to honor these privileges during Columbus's lifetime, they were largely upheld for his descendants, who became Dukes of Veragua and maintained a prominent place in the Spanish nobility. Christopher Columbus died on May 20, 1506, in Valladolid, Spain, not as the acclaimed explorer he once was, but in relative obscurity. His death marked the end of a turbulent life, a life characterized by tremendous achievements, grave errors, unyielding ambition, and deep disappointments. However, Columbus's death was not the end of his story. In the centuries that followed, his life and voyages became subjects of extensive debate and reinterpretation. In our final chapter, we will examine the complexities of this legacy, and how Columbus's discovery of America has been viewed from different perspectives through history. Chapter 9, The Impact of Discovery The life of Christopher Columbus may have ended in relative obscurity, but the waves caused by his discovery of the New World continued to ripple across the centuries. His voyages set in motion a cascade of events that reshaped the world, altering its demographic, cultural, and political landscapes in ways that are still evident today. The impacts of his discoveries were far-reaching and complex, inspiring progress and ambition on one hand while causing unimaginable destruction and suffering on the other. The immediate effect of Columbus's voyages was to usher in an era of intense exploration and colonization by European powers. The Spanish, Portuguese, English, French, and Dutch all embarked on missions to explore and claim parts of the New World. Maps were redrawn, new trade routes were established, and the concept of the world was fundamentally transformed. The age of discovery had begun in earnest, setting the stage for what would become a global age of exploration, trade, and colonization. Simultaneously, Columbus's discovery had a profound effect on Europe's economic and political structures. The influx of wealth from the New World, particularly precious metals, fueled economic development, funding the Renaissance and eventually leading to the rise of capitalism. Spain, in particular, emerged as one of the wealthiest and most powerful nations in Europe. This newfound wealth and power realigned the balance of power, contributing to significant geopolitical shifts. In a broader sense, the encounters Columbus facilitated between the old and new worlds led to the Columbian Exchange, a term coined by historian Alfred Crosby. This exchange refers to the transfer, both ways, of plants, animals, culture, human populations, technology, diseases, and ideas. It introduced Europe to crops like potatoes, tomatoes, and maize, which had profound implications for European diets and agricultural practices. Simultaneously, it introduced the Americas to horses, cattle, and wheat, along with various diseases against which indigenous populations had no immunity. On the darker side, Columbus's voyages marked the beginning of a devastating period for the indigenous populations of the Americas. The introduction of old world diseases such as smallpox, measles, and influenza to the New World led to catastrophic death tolls among native populations, who lacked immunity to these foreign diseases. Some estimates suggest that up to 90% of the native population in some areas may have been wiped out by these epidemics. Moreover, the arrival of Columbus heralded an era of brutal exploitation and cultural destruction for the indigenous peoples. Enslaved, abused, and dispossessed of their lands, the indigenous civilizations of the Americas faced a grim fate in the aftermath of Columbus's discovery. Their complex and diverse societies, rich in their own traditions and achievements, were largely decimated and overridden by the European colonizers. Columbus's legacy is, therefore, a complex and controversial one. He is undeniably a monumental figure in history, whose voyages had transformative impacts on the world. However, these impacts include not only exploration and progress but also exploitation, destruction, and suffering. 
In understanding and interpreting Columbus, we must grapple with these dual aspects of his legacy. The narratives of discovery and progress must be balanced against the harsh realities of colonization and destruction. Only then can we fully appreciate the profound and lasting impacts of Christopher Columbus's voyages on our world. Chapter 10, Conclusion, Columbus, A Man of His Times In the final analysis of the life and voyages of Christopher Columbus, it becomes evident that the Genoese mariner was, in many ways, a man of his times, embodying the complexities and contradictions of the age of discovery. As we re-evaluate Columbus's legacy through the lens of modern scholarship and perspectives, we grapple with the multifaceted nature of his contribution to human history, balancing between the precipice of monumental discovery and the abyss of devastating exploitation. Columbus was a man of considerable courage, tenacity, and vision. His relentless pursuit of a westward route to Asia, against the odds and in the face of repeated failures and rejections, set a high watermark for exploratory ambition. The voyages he undertook changed the course of history, facilitating connections between disparate worlds, introducing unprecedented opportunities for trade and cultural exchange, and kick-starting an era of global exploration. These were remarkable achievements by any measure, and for these, Columbus has long been heralded as a hero, a pioneering explorer who enlarged the boundaries of the known world. However, the passage of time and the development of more inclusive and critical perspectives on history have necessitated a re-evaluation of Columbus's legacy. In this regard, Columbus also embodied the darker aspects of the age of discovery, the devastating consequences of colonial exploitation, and the eradication of native cultures. The genocide of indigenous peoples, the transatlantic slave trade, the ruthless quest for gold and wealth, and the imposition of foreign religions and cultures, these are aspects of Columbus's legacy that cannot be overlooked. These realities remind us that the discovery of the New World was, for its original inhabitants, an apocalyptic catastrophe. It is critical, therefore, to understand Columbus as a man operating within the ethos of his era, an era defined by both the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of power. His actions and choices, however courageous or calamitous, were shaped by a European worldview that championed exploration and expansion, even at a devastating human cost. Christopher Columbus remains an enigmatic figure in the annals of history, a man who straddles the divide between progress and destruction, knowledge and power, exploration and exploitation. As we look back at his life and his voyages, we are reminded that history is seldom a tale of unambiguous heroes or villains, but rather a complex tapestry woven with threads of both light and shadow. In commemorating Columbus, we must strive to tell a more complete and nuanced story, acknowledging his pioneering voyages and the resulting cultural exchange, while not shying away from the darker aspects of his legacy. By doing so, we honor not just the courage of the explorer, but also the resilience of those who suffered in the wake of his discovery. This nuanced understanding allows us to use history not just as a mirror reflecting the past, but also as a lens through which we scrutinize and learn from it, enabling us to navigate the complexities of our present world. More information and facts. Part 1. Perspectives from Indigenous Peoples The narrative of Christopher Columbus, while often focused primarily on the journey and achievements of the Genoese explorer, inevitably intertwines with the stories and experiences of the Indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. It is essential to delve into these perspectives to paint a more complete, balanced, and nuanced picture of the events set into motion in 1492. It is challenging to reconstruct the full breadth of indigenous perspectives on Columbus's arrival, primarily due to the oral nature of their historical tradition and the lack of written records. However, through careful archaeological research, interpretation of oral traditions, and analysis of the scant comments in the chronicles of the Europeans themselves, a picture can emerge of the complex and varied responses of indigenous peoples to these pivotal encounters. The peoples Columbus encountered on his first voyage, the Taino, Lucayan, and others, had developed societies adapted to the opportunities and constraints of life in the Caribbean archipelago. Despite being organized into chiefdoms, these societies were largely communal, with an economy based on agriculture, fishing, and trade. Their spirituality was deeply tied to nature, with Zemus, or spirit beings, playing a significant role. Upon Columbus's arrival, 
reactions among indigenous peoples ranged from curiosity to fear. Some viewed the foreigners as powerful beings to be either placated or resisted. Many tribes, notably the Taino, initially welcomed the Spanish, offering food, water, and gifts. However, as time passed and the Spanish intentions became apparent, relations deteriorated. The indigenous perspective of this historical juncture is, unfortunately, one of devastation and loss. The rapid spread of old world diseases, to which the indigenous people had no immunity, resulted in catastrophic mortality rates. In addition, the harsh systems of forced labor imposed by the Spanish, such as the encomienda system, resulted in further deaths and suffering. These hardships were met with resistance. While some indigenous peoples tried to escape the harsh conditions by fleeing into the mountains, others organized revolts. The Taino Rebellion of 1495, led by a cacique named Caunabo, was one of the first recorded uprisings against Spanish rule in the New World. These acts of resistance reveal an aspect of indigenous agency and resilience often overlooked in traditional narratives. Sadly, despite their efforts, the indigenous cultures of the Caribbean were largely decimated within a few generations of European contact. But they were not entirely erased. In the survival and adaptation of their descendants, the resistance of these first peoples continues. Today, elements of their cultures persist in the form of language, folklore, agriculture, and spirituality. To truly understand the impact of Columbus's voyages, we must always remember that for the indigenous peoples of the Americas, the discovery of the New World was not a moment of mutual exploration and exchange, but rather the beginning of an existential struggle. Their voices, often muted in the historical narrative, carry the echoes of this struggle, a testament to their endurance and resilience in the face of unimaginable challenges. These voices are essential in achieving a more comprehensive and empathetic understanding of this pivotal epoch in human history. Part 2, Contextual Background, The Sociopolitical and Economic Landscape of the 15th Century To fully understand Christopher Columbus's daring proposition and its subsequent endorsement by the Spanish monarchy, we must first understand the geopolitical and economic realities of the late 15th century. The period leading up to Columbus's voyage was marked by significant changes, both in Europe and globally. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 to the Ottoman Turks had profound repercussions on the balance of power in the existing trade routes. The Ottoman control over the land-based routes to Asia meant that access to lucrative Eastern goods, like spices, silk, and precious gems, had become more challenging and costly for the Western European powers. Asia, specifically India and China, had a bounty of spices, silks, and precious stones desired by Europeans. However, these products had to traverse complex, perilous, and expensive routes to reach European markets. They often changed hands multiple times, each time accruing additional costs. Thus, whoever controlled these trade routes wielded enormous economic power. Simultaneously, Europe was undergoing a transformation of its own. The Renaissance, a period of cultural and intellectual revival, had taken firm roots, marking a shift from the religious orthodoxy of the Middle Ages. With an increased interest in scientific investigation and geographical knowledge, the era saw a surge in exploration, spurred by the promise of fame, wealth, and national prestige. Furthermore, Spain, under the united rule of Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, was at the cusp of significant change. The successful completion of the Reconquista in 1492 with the conquest of Granada marked the end of centuries of Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Spain was eager to emerge as a leading European power and saw an opportunity in Columbus's proposal. The potential of a western sea route to Asia, bypassing Ottoman-controlled territories, held the promise of a trade monopoly with the East. This opportunity promised not just enormous wealth, but also a strategic advantage over rival powers, such as Portugal, which had already begun to establish a sea route to Asia around Africa's Cape of Good Hope. The support Columbus received was, therefore, not an act of blind faith, but a calculated gamble. Spain was willing to risk the expense of the expedition in the hope of securing a faster, safer, and more profitable route to the riches of the East. Part 3, Contrasting Views on Columbus, From Hero to Controversial Figure 
the legacy of Christopher Columbus is one of paradoxes and contradictions. Once a revered figure, emblematic of daring, discovery, and the spirit of exploration, Columbus has more recently been the subject of intense scrutiny and debate. The evolving perceptions of Columbus are not just reflections of the man and his actions, but are also indicative of changing societal values and the ways in which history is interpreted and understood. Columbus was hailed as a hero for centuries, especially in Europe and the Americas. His voyage marked the beginning of sustained contact between the old and new worlds, opening the door to cultural exchange, colonization, and eventually the world as we know it today. This achievement earned him a revered place in the annals of history, with his name adorning countless cities, streets, and monuments. In the United States, the reverence for Columbus was particularly strong. Columbus Day, first celebrated in 1792 on the 300th anniversary of his voyage, became a federal holiday in 1937. For many, especially Italian Americans, Columbus Day was a source of pride, a celebration of their heritage and their contributions to American society. However, this conventional narrative began to face significant pushback in the late 20th century. As societal values shifted towards a greater emphasis on human rights and the experiences of marginalized groups, a more critical view of Columbus began to emerge. Columbus, critics argued, was not just an explorer, but also a colonizer, whose voyages set off the widespread decimation of the indigenous populations of the Americas. The forced labor, violence, and disease that followed Columbus's arrival resulted in severe suffering and loss of life, often described as a genocide. This criticism culminated in the establishment of Indigenous Peoples Day, a counter-celebration to Columbus Day that honors Native American heritage and resilience. First proposed in 1977 at the United Nations Conference, the idea gained traction in the following decades, with numerous cities and states in the U.S. officially replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. The debate surrounding Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day is more than just a dispute over historical facts. It is a reflection of broader debates about the nature of history itself, who is remembered, and how they are remembered. It raises questions about whether historical figures should be judged by the standards and values of their time or those of the present, and how to reconcile the dark aspects of a celebrated figure's legacy with their achievements. Part 4. The Science of Navigation, Navigating the Open Sea in the Age of Discovery Exploration in the 15th century was both a courageous and a perilous endeavor, driven by a pioneering spirit and a thirst for wealth, knowledge, and prestige. The sea was a vast, unpredictable expanse, and venturing into the unknown required both skill and a fair share of luck. However, it was also an age of scientific progress, with advancements in navigation techniques and tools playing a crucial role in enabling voyages such as Columbus's to take place. Navigational knowledge during this era was based on a blend of practical experience and theoretical knowledge, much of which was preserved and transmitted through portal and charts, navigational handbooks, and sailor's rudders. These resources offered practical instructions on sailing routes, navigational landmarks, and techniques to use various navigational instruments. One of the most crucial navigational tools of the time was the compass. Originating from China, this tool was refined in the Mediterranean during the 12th and 13th centuries. It allowed mariners to determine their direction relative to magnetic north, thus enabling them to maintain a consistent course even when landmarks were not visible. The astrolabe, an instrument that measured the altitude of celestial bodies above the horizon, was another essential tool. By measuring the angle of the sun or a known star, mariners could calculate their latitude, providing a sense of how far north or south they were. However, determining longitude, or one's east-west position, remained a significant challenge until the invention of accurate marine chronometers in the 18th century. Dead reckoning was also a common technique. This method involved estimating one's current position based on a previously known position, the course that had been steered, the distance traveled, and the time that had elapsed. Although it was prone to cumulative errors over long distances, it was an essential tool in the absence of reliable methods to determine longitude. Navigation also involved challenges like maintaining a fresh water supply and dealing with diseases such as scurvy. Scurvy, caused by a deficiency of vitamin C, was a common ailment for sailors on long voyages, leading to symptoms like anemia, debility, and even death. However, 
the connection between diet and scurvy was not yet understood in Columbus's time. Various methods were employed to conserve water, including the use of wine or beer, which had a longer shelf life, and capturing rainwater when possible. It is worth noting that Columbus's voyages also exemplified the limitations of navigational science of his time. His underestimation of the Earth's size and over-reliance on certain texts led him to believe that Asia could be reached by sailing westward from Europe much more quickly than was actually the case. Nevertheless, despite the limitations and hardships, the successful completion of Columbus's voyages marked a significant achievement in navigation. They symbolized the growing capability of Europeans to traverse and gradually understand the vast and mysterious world of the open seas, heralding a new age of exploration and discovery. Part 5, Columbus's Crew, The Men Behind the Legend Embarking on Columbus's voyages into the uncharted waters of the Atlantic were not just a daring explorer and his noble patrons, but also a diverse crew of mariners, convicts, and adventurers. These were the men who manned the decks of the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, risking their lives in the pursuit of wealth, honor, and the unknown. Their experiences offer a fascinating perspective into the realities of sea voyages during the Age of Discovery. The crew of the three ships numbered about 90 men. Many of these crew members came from the Andalusian region of Spain, particularly from the town surrounding the port of Palos de la Frontera, where the journey began. Some were experienced sailors, and others, less so. Among the experienced was the Pinzon brothers, Martin Alonso, Vicente Yanez, and Francisco Martin, who were sailors from Palos. Martin Alonso, the most prominent of the brothers, captained the Pinta, while Vicente helmed the Nina. Their local influence and sailing expertise were instrumental in the success of the voyage. Martin Alonso was particularly crucial in keeping the mutinous crew in check and pushing for the continuation of the journey, even when the prospects seemed grim. There was a range of motivations that led men to join this voyage. For some, it was the allure of potential riches, lured by the promise that they could keep a percentage of any gold or spices they discovered. For others, it was the prospect of an alternative to prison. A royal decree from Ferdinand and Isabella had promised pardons to convicts who signed up for the voyage, making it an attractive prospect for those with limited options. Life aboard the ships was harsh and fraught with danger. The crew had to contend with cramped conditions, poor nutrition, and the constant threat of disease. Morale was a constant issue. According to Columbus's diary entries, the crew were terrified and desperate as weeks passed without sight of land, and mutinous whispers grew louder. When they finally reached the New World, these men were the first Europeans to encounter the diverse ecosystems and indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. They interacted with the Taino and Arawak peoples, trading goods, and at times, engaging in conflict. Some crew members were left behind on the return journey to Spain, to establish the short-lived settlement of La Navidad, on the island of Hispaniola. Upon return to Spain, some of these crewmen, such as Rodrigo de Triana, who was reportedly the first to sight land, and the Pinzon brothers, were celebrated, while others slipped back into obscurity. Their experiences and perspectives, often overlooked, provide a more complete understanding of the risks, hardships, and occasional triumphs of the epic journey Columbus undertook. In providing these accounts of the crew, we see not just the trials and tribulations of a single man, but a collective endeavor that reshaped the course of world history. Columbus's voyages were a shared effort, requiring not only the vision of an explorer but the skill, courage, and resilience of the ordinary men who risked their lives in the service of this audacious enterprise. Part 6, The Legacy in Modern Popular Culture, Columbus in Literature, Art, and Film. The voyage of Christopher Columbus to the Americas is a story that has been recounted and reinterpreted countless times since 1492, each rendition shaped by the cultural and historical context in which it was produced. Through an examination of how Columbus has been depicted in various forms of popular culture, from literature and art to film and even holidays, we can trace evolving societal perceptions of Columbus and his legacy, providing a lens into wider cultural shifts. In the centuries immediately following his voyages, Columbus was celebrated in European literature as a heroic explorer, a view that was reflected in many of the artworks of the time. For instance, the frescoes in the Hall of Maps at the Vatican, painted in the 16th century, 
depict Columbus in a reverential light, representing him as a brave and pioneering navigator. This trend continued into the Romantic era, with paintings such as Columbus Before the Queen by Emanuel Leutze, presenting a glorified image of Columbus as a visionary who triumphed over doubt and adversity. The advent of the 19th and early 20th centuries brought a renewed interest in Columbus's journey, particularly in the United States, where he was perceived as a founding figure of the nation. Literary works such as Washington Irving's A History of the Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus, 1828, largely contributed to this perception, providing an embellished account of Columbus's life and journey that captivated the American public. Columbus has also found his place in the silver screen, where his life and expeditions have been portrayed in several films. Christopher Columbus. The Discovery, 1992, and Ridley Scott's 1492, Conquest of Paradise, 1992, were released to coincide with the 500th anniversary of Columbus's first voyage. However, these films, which portray Columbus in a heroic light, were met with criticism and controversy, reflecting a shift in public opinion and increased awareness of the impact of European colonization on the indigenous populations of the Americas. School curricula and public holidays have also been arenas of contestation and revision in recent years. Columbus Day, celebrated in many parts of the United States, has increasingly been replaced by Indigenous Peoples Day, in recognition of the suffering inflicted upon native populations following Columbus's arrival. This change reflects a significant shift in the cultural narrative surrounding Columbus, one that seeks to provide a more comprehensive and nuanced understanding of history. More recently, authors and artists have started to re-examine Columbus's legacy from different perspectives. Novels like Encounter by Jane Yolen reinterpret Columbus's journey from the perspective of a young Taino boy, offering insights into the experiences of indigenous people. Such efforts underscore a conscious shift to broaden the narrative, emphasizing voices and experiences that have been marginalized or overlooked in previous depictions. Christopher Columbus and his voyages have left an indelible mark on global history and culture. The way his story has been portrayed and retold across centuries reflects the evolving values and priorities of society. His journey, once hailed as an unparalleled act of bravery and discovery, has increasingly come under scrutiny, serving as a reflection of the growing recognition of colonial impacts and the importance of indigenous narratives. As cultural attitudes continue to shift, so too will the depiction of Columbus and his legacy, reminding us that history is not just a matter of the past, but a continuous dialogue between past and present. Thanks for watching to the end. See you in new videos.